to pray. Father, we just thank you for just an amazing time in your presence, Lord. We thank you for the anointing of God that was here. And you truly inhabit the praises of your people, Lord, and the spirit of worship that was in this place, Lord. We just pray that um, as we transition into the word, that you would just open our hearts. Let the word of God be knitted in our hearts and in our minds, God, bringing transformation and change in our lives, Father. Pray for a fresh revelation today, the spirit of wisdom and revelation to come down and hit. That this word would, would hit its mark, God. So I bless this time and I bless everyone in this room and online in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And Pastor Trisha was, she mentioned the election and, you know, we just want to be clear that we we don't I mean we celebrate the the, uh, the election but we don't we don't worship Donald Trump right this whole thing wasn't about Donald Trump it wasn't as Donald Trump is a very flawed man and, and we we see that you know he needs Jesus just like we do right this whole thing was about the future of America it was about the future of this world and and uh, I think that like, like I said last week or the week before, that there, there was no perfect choice, but the better choice was the right choice in this situation. Amen? And I believe the better choice won for the future of our children. And I'm talking about generational curses and generational blessing, and I believe that, you know, the Lord, he designed this thing with, with the Senate and the House and the White House to be all in one accord because, see, here's the thing, church, now this is, we prayed and we pray and we pray, right? But we need to continue to pray. We need to continue to press in so that this establishment could hear from the Lord. Because now there, there is a setup to, to, to put policy, foreign policy, domestic policy in place, okay, that could, I don't want to get all political, but policy in place that could impact generations, my children and their children's children to come. Amen. So, church, it's time to really start praying. It's time to pray that this established, the, 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 the White House would hear from the Lord and, and fulfill the will of God for this nation in these next four years. Amen? Amen. So, I'm talking about the generational curses, breaking generational curses, generational iniquities. And then we're going to end with a generational blessing, the blessing of the Lord. Amen. I'm going to read Exodus 20, verses 1 through 6 out of the New Living Translation. And it says, then God gave the people all these instructions. And this is right while he was giving them the Ten Commandments. He gave Moses the Ten Commandments. He says, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. And we know that the... The Israelites, they were in slavery for 400 years, and they, it was approximately 14 or 15 generations of, of, of the Israelites that were in slavery. So you had, if it was 14 generations, you had 13 generations that were born into slavery, and that's all they knew, that the, the mindset that they knew physically, spiritually, every part of what they knew was to be in slavery. And so we're talking about generational curses Right? And so these people, the Israelites, were living in a curse of bondage for 400 years. Verse 3 says, you must not have any other God but me. And now he's establishing that he is the one true God. And they are to serve him and only him, the great I am. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. And he says, I lay the sins of the parents upon the children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. And here's a beautiful part. But I lavish my unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. 
And so in verse 5 where he says, I lay the sins of the parents upon the children and the entire family is affected. What he's talking about is the sins of the fathers, generational sin, generational iniquity, and the resulting curses that come from those sins. Right? See here, everyone in the natural, everyone here has parents. Right? If you're on this earth, you, you had a father and you had a mother. Right? And so there is something that we call physical genetics. Right? There, there are genetics that we get from our parents. Right? There are mannerisms that we, that we get from our parents. I, I have a lot of mannerisms. A lot of you know my father here. He, he comes here. But uh, some of our mannerism, mannerisms are exactly the same. Right? I, I have an older brother that people see my older brother and, and they don't know he's my brother. But they know he's my brother when they see him because we have so, much, so many resemblances, physical resemblances, because of the gen, genetics that are passed down from my parents. Are you guys following me? So just like there are physical genetics, there are also spiritual genetics that are passed down in the bloodline, okay, that we get from our parents and we share with our siblings and, and also they are passed down to our children and our children's children. So there is something in the blood, in the bloodlines that is passed down. Are you still with me? Blessings and iniquities are passed down through our Family through our bloodlines. Okay? Now, Ex Exodus 20 is talking about idolatry and the worship of idols. I'll say it again. Verse 4. Go back to Exodus 20, verse 4. You must not make yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heaven or on the earth or in the sea. So it's talking about idolatry. It's talking about idols. And what is idolatry? Idolatry is worship of an idol. And what is an idol? An idol is anything that we put before the Lord. An idol is anything that takes our affection away and we give the affection that we should be giving to the Lord to that thing. It could be a person. It could be a place. It could be a, it could be a thing, okay? So idolatry is anything that we put before the Lord. And there are a lot of sins that are rooted in idolatry, okay? Uh, one, one sin is the sin of addiction, all right, is rooted in idolatry. Drugs and alcoholism is idolatry. Pornography, sexual sin, and, and, and you know, sexual sin and perversion is rooted in idolatry. Why? Because all these sins that I'm talking about is about self. It's about how could I please myself, right? It's how could I, what, what drug, what, what alcohol here is going to make me feel better? Right when the only thing that should be we that should making us feel good is the is the presence of God, right? So we're putting those things, addictions, escapes, dependencies, right before the Lord, and it's rooted in idolatry. And this and the Lord is strictly warning us here in Exodus 20 that as we fall into this sin, the sin will be passed down, the sin of idolatry. It will be passed down to our generations that follow. It's a strict warning. Now let's look at Exodus 34, verse 7 in the New Living Translation. It says, I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. Beautiful. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Now this is a promise from the Lord, right? He forgives our iniquities, our rebellion, and our sins. But the, verse, the next sentence says, but I do not excuse the guilty. Okay? Now you and I could sin. And this, the moment we ask for forgiveness, we will be forgiven. He wants to forgive you. It is in his nature because he loves us so much, right? He sent his only begotten son that he wants to forgive you. He says, I forgive iniquity, rebellion, sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. And so what he's saying here, if you choose to stay in that sin, if you choose to continue to go back into that sin and, and dwell in it, you will not be excused because you are guilty of that thing. You have not fully repented of this sin. And because he does not excuse the guilty, he says, I lay the sins of the parents upon the children and the, and the grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even the children in the third and fourth generations. And so I could sin right now. I could, I could judge somebody of doing something, right? That's sin, right? I could, I could fall into the sin of unbelief because unbelief is sin. How many, how many of you know that? 
right? But the moment that I repent and realize, oh, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned. I am forgiven. I am pure. I am clean. I, I am made pure before his eyes. But if I continue to sin, continuous sin, and I choose to stay in that sin, I'm, I am now bringing a curse upon my life that will be passed down to my children and my children's children. There is something powerful about this, church. He says, I do not excuse the guilty. If you continue to be guilty, I will lay the sins of the parents upon their children and the grandchildren. So you can actually create a curse in your own life. Even if it's not coming from, from your ancestors, from your father or your mother, you could create a generational curse that will be passed down. Watch Galatians 3.13. And this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love it. Because this, I'm not trying to preach a doom, a doom and gloom message here. Because in the gospel there is hope, right? There is freedom. There is redemption. There is wholeness. There is salvation. Amen? So this is a gospel. I love the gospel. I, I shared the gospel yesterday at the, uh, at the food distribution. And uh, it's just an amazing thing to share the gospel of hope, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what he did for me in bringing me freedom. From, from anxiety and sin. And, and so Galatians 3.13 says, but Christ has rescued us from the curse. He's rescued us from the curse. And that word rescue, it says, it means to save someone from a dangerous or distressing situation. So he rescued us. He saved us from a dangerous and distressing situation, from the curse pronounced by the law when he was hung on the cross. He took upon himself the curse of our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. And so the key thing here in verse 13 is talking about the curse that we're being rescued from the curse. And as we're rescued from the curse, if you look at 14, it says, through Christ Jesus, God has blessed us. He's blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing that he promised. And so in place of the curse, we receive the blessing of the Lord, which is the Holy Spirit, and everything that he provides us. Amen? Yeah. So this is the truth. This is the reality of what we live in. We, we ought to be living in the blessing of the Lord, not the cursing, right? Not the curse. But all too much, I say this, all too much we see believers that are stuck in, 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 their, in their walking out this generational curse in iniquity. And they haven't applied the blood of Jesus specifically to break that curse. We can help you, amen? Yeah, there's so many believers still operating in generational iniquities. So generational iniquities, as I said before, can be passed down through, through our genes, through our genetics, right? Spiritually, through the blood of Jesus, right? But there are also other ways that it can be passed down. And it could be passed down through example, generational sin I'm talking about, right? It, it could be passed down through example, or a better way to say it is maybe it could be taught or demonstrated by our parents. Okay, what am I saying here? For instance, if, if my parents... Uh, if, if they live a life of cheating or deception or dishonesty, right, or failure or laziness, right, if, if they're teaching me how, how to be neglectful or, or to have a poverty mindset and, and to be in poverty and, or to pr procrastinate, pr procrastinate everything, right, poor stewardship, I am, they are passing down a generational curse onto me through the demonstration of how they live. All, right, all these things are taught or, or they're exampled, right, as, as they are passed down generationally. Anger teaches anger. Okay? If there's a family that all they do is, is, is yell, right, and curse, and they communicate, and, and, and there's always chaos in the house, right? The parents are, are teaching the kids, this is how we communicate, right? What are the kids going to do? The kids are going to do the same exact thing. They're going to learn how to communicate. Now, this is, this is generational anger, right? That, so they're going to live their lives as little children like this, and then they're going to raise families. They're going to be adults living the same exact way. It's generational. 
right? So, so there's genetics, there's examples or, or, or the behavior on what we teach. But another way is, another way to pass down generational sin is, is passed down through the law of sowing and reaping. The law of sowing and reaping. And, you know, this, this sounds a little bit like an Elijah house course. And, and that's okay. <laughs> Excuse me. It's hot in here. <laughs> All right, sowing and reaping, right? So just, just an example. If there's abuse in a home, right? If, if there's, if there's uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, whatever, whatever type of abuse it is, right? If, if, if a father's abusing his son, right? If a father's abusing his, his son physically, right, or, or verbally, Right there's gonna there's gonna be a wound in that young man's heart, right? Even from a young age, six seven years old, he's being abused, right? He something in him knows that this isn't normal. Something in him knows that this is not right, and there's a heart wound being created in this young man's heart. And now, because of the unforgiveness in his life, right? Right? Whenever we're we're hurt by somebody, we 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 have unforgiveness or bitterness or resentment in our heart towards that person that we hurt that hurt us right you guys following me the the next thing to come where there's unforgiveness bitterness and resentment is a judgment right we judge that person for hurting us we judge that person for abusing us we judge that person for for molesting us or whatever it is right for taking advantage of us for bullying us and all those judgments that are in our heart have actual power, right, because it's a spiritual law. Who here has heard of spiritual laws? There's constant spiritual laws in place. If I were to take this microphone right now, now this isn't a spiritual law, I would say this is a physical law, right, and drop it, right, the law of gravity would say that that thing has to fall, and it would fall. Right? So the law of sowing and reaping with judgments, as Matthew 7 says... I'm going to read Matthew 7, 1 through 5, because it's good that we get this. It says, do not judge that you be not judged. For with, the, with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So I'm over here judging you, but there's, there's a bigger plank in my eye. Right? So the law of sowing and reaping says, for the measure that you judge will be the measure that you will be judged. So if I'm, if I have a, if I'm holding a judgment on somebody, even if they wronged me, even if, they, even if they're... If, if I feel like I'm right in judging them, it's not my place to judge because I'm not God. So the spiritual law says because I'm judging you, I'm going to be held to that judgment in my own life at one point or the other. It's a spiritual law. It will manifest in one way or the other. Okay, now it may not manifest in the same way that it happened to you, but it will manifest in that way. So now you have, for instance, a, a, you know, a son or daughter that, that's watching an alcoholic father, right? And we know the devastations of alcoholism in the, in, in the house, right? There's abandonment, there's rejection, there's disappointment, right? There, there's possibly physical abuse, right? Eventually the father will leave and disappear and all these things, right? And so I, now the judgment is in that person's heart, right? That young man's going to grow up to be a man that probably is going to, have tr trouble with alcoholism and if not because there's a vow there that says I'll never be an alcoholic he will be addicted to something else why because of the wound the unforgiveness and the the the, the bitter root judgment in his heart will manifest in one way or the other and so here you have a generational sin that turns into a curse and it is passed down to the, to the children and the children's children through the law of sowing and reaping. You guys tracking? All right. 
Now, it, it, every, everything that happens, I mean, I, I thought about John 9, where, um, you know, the disciples, they're walking up to the blind man, and they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this, this man or his parents, that the, he, the, the man was born blind, right? And Jesus said, well, no one sinned, right? So, so not, every, not every sin, not every disease, not everything that we see is generational, amen? Right? We, we could be clean slated and, and, and fall into something else or have a disease or, or sin ourselves, but not everything is a generational sin. But there are ways to, to, to see generational sins or patterns. And a good example of that is in the, in the Bible is in Genesis 12. And I've thought about this often when I think about uh, uh, generational sins and iniquities, but it's in Genesis 12 where Abraham lied about his relationship with his wife Sarah. Right, he he told he told her to say that she was his sister, right? Because he knew she was beautiful, a beautiful woman, and he was actually afraid. Okay, now key word here is fear. Abraham was afraid that the Egyptians would would kill him, and take Sarah to be his, their wife. Right? Now, there were, there's, this thing here, the the deception came from a root of fear, right? Now, fast, that's in Genesis 12. If you fast forward to Genesis 26, his son did literally the same exact thing, right? Isaac told the men of Gerar that his wife, Rebekah, was his sister, right? And it says he was afraid that they would kill him and take her. So both father and son, they, they both lied, right? There was deception, the lying spirit in place there, right? There was deception because there was fear and unbelief, right, that God wouldn't protect them and that God wasn't who he said he was, right? So the unbelief, fear and doubt, fear and unbelief was the root sin. It led to deception, and they both did it generationally. You see that? Now, it was very, this is a very specific uh, sin and iniquity that was activated, I would say, if that's a good word, activated by the condition, okay, of the situation, right? What do, I, what do I mean by that? Like, so multiple situations, multiple occasions, I've seen where, and after doing ministry and after having conversations and talking, that there was a generational sin and iniquity of divorce in the family line. Now, I've seen, where, when, I'm, when I'm talking about the conditions and, and this generational sin being activated, hear me. Okay, a couple living together for 10, 12 years, multiple, multiple situations I've seen, right? Where obviously they're living in sin, they're not married, but there's children. The relationship is good, right? I mean, they're, they're not living right before the Lord, but, you know, they're happy and, and they're just living life, right? They're, they're prospering, whatever it may be, right? But they're living in sin and they decide to get married. And within a year's time, right? Because they entered into covenant, because they entered into marriage, within a year's time, they're already getting a divorce. Why? Because the generational sin and iniquity of divorce or the breaking of covenant was activated, right? The conditions or the situation was right. That thing was activated, and then it took place and manifested. You guys following? I've seen multiple, multiple incidences like that. I'm just going to be personal, you know. Not, we're going we're gonna to pray. I've got a couple more scriptures here. But there are multiple examples in my family that, I, I, you know, ask the Lord for you, right? Ask the Lord. I, I've pursued the Lord on this, and I've talked to my parents. I've talked to other people. But so two, two examples, you know, for instance, you know, I, you know, I don't care. I'll just, I'll, I'll be personal. <laughs> uh, on my father's side, divorce runs rampant. All right? 80% I, I, of the marriages have ended in divorce in, in my father's side from his aunts and uncles and, and all that. I, it, it's, it's real. And he went from marriage to marriage and uncle to uncle and cousin to cousin saying how, you know, they, went divorce, they were divorced or he's on his third marriage and, and so and so. So we see that there is a generational curse on that side of the family of the breaking of covenant or divorce, right? On the other side of the family, my, my mother's side, from my children all the way to my grandparents, there's a generational sin of children being born out of wedlock. 
Okay, there's, I count it from my grandparents down to my children. There's, there's 66 people, 66 people. And, and over 70% of the people from that generation, four generations down, over 70% were conceived outside of wedlock. And it was because my grandparents, they had nine children, and seven of them were born out of wedlock, were conceived out of wedlock, and they lived like they were married. And so you see that as you pray or as you pursue these truths, right, of your generation, right, and, and these are believers, right, these are, these are so-called professing Christians that are, or a Christian family, right, not everybody's walking right with the Lord, but, but it was a prayer point for me to really, to really see this identify as the Holy Spirit shows me and then breaking these generational sins and iniquities off of my bloodline so that my children don't or wouldn't have to experience this. Amen? Amen. So we have to watch out for the recurring patterns, right? And this could be something that you do tonight. Look out for the recurring patterns. And then I'm going to go through a prayer, and you got, you got the, prayer, the, the sheet of paper. I'm going to share some scripture that pertains to the prayer because it's important that we know what we're doing, Okay? And so these things will not be broken unless we apply the blood of Jesus and the cross to them. All right? And the cross, forgiveness is achieved, but we have to repent. So let's just go to this prayer real quick. It says, sins of the fathers and resulting curses. And then the other sheet of paper is, uh, it says generational sin and iniquity. So this is taken from a much larger uh, list of, of uh, sins and generational curses that we have when we do ministry. But I just took, I, I, I just took the, the big ones that, I see, that we see a lot. So if you look at that piece of paper where it says sins of the fathers and resulting curses, it says, I confess the sin of my ancestors, my parents, and my own sin of. Now, whatever it is, right? In my case, it was, it was divorce, right? But so John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, right, because number one says, I confess the sin of my ancestors. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, right? So the process of this prayer is confessing the sin, right? He will purify us, right, from all unrighteousness. He will forgive our sins. So we confess our sins. Right? But you're not just confessing your sin, you're confessing the sins of your ancestors and your parents on, on their behalf. Because this is a generational sin and iniquity. Amen? All right. Two is, now it's forgiveness. Right? Because forgiveness is the foundation of our faith. Right? With, without being forgiven, we can't be in relationship or communion with God. Right? So it says, I choose to forgive and release them. Now Matthew 6.14 says... For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their, their sins, your heavenly Father won't forgive your, your sins, right? So you have to forgive. Very important, right? If you realize that this is a generational thing, right, that you're experiencing this sin and iniquity or whatever it may be, this sickness, disease, right, abandonment, rejection, divorce, poor stewardship, Right? If you realize your experiences that because of your ancestors, there's a process of forgiving them for that. Right? You have to forgive them for the sin and the consequences of your life. Because you could just be sitting there like, oh man, like I'm going through this because my grandfather was 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 crazy and he did that. Right? So bitterness, resentment could really come into your heart. You need to forgive them so that you could be forgiven. I'm not being legalistic. This is all scripture here, okay? All right, so three says, I ask you to forgive me, Lord, for this sin. Now, this is where repentance on your heart comes in, right? I ask you to forgive me, Lord, for, for the sin, for yielding to it, to the resulting curses. I receive your forgiveness. And so now we're going to the cross, 
right? We're, we're, we're repenting for the generation of sin. You've already achieved forgiveness, forgiveness for your ancestors, for imparting that thing on you. Now you're going to the cross and you're being forgiven and cleansed and purified, right? On the basis of your forgiveness, four, on the basis of your forgiveness, Lord, I choose to forgive myself for involvement of this sin. Man, we don't, I don't think we realize how important it is to forgive ourselves, guys. It really is super important that we forgive ourselves. People, we are hard on ourselves. Sometimes, sometimes the, the hardest person that we're on, on is, is ourselves, right? And unforgiveness to yourself is still unforgiveness. So on the basis of your forgiveness, I choose to forgive myself for involvement of this sin. Five, this is powerful, right? I renounce the sin and curses of... Shame, bitterness, pride, mocking, performance, right? All, you know, whatever it is in your bloodline that the Lord is identifying or showing you, you renounce it, right? You renounce it off your life, right? You've already been forgiven. Now you're breaking it off. You're breaking its power off of your life. You break the power from, from its life, right? And it says, from the lives of my descendant, descendants through the redemptive work of the cross, of Christ on the cross, and I love Ephesians 1.7. I feel like I've really been on this verse. Ephesians 1.7 says, In him we have redemption with his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We have redemption through the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins in, according, in accordance to the riches of God's grace. So there's redemption from these curses. There's redemption from these sins through the blood of Jesus. So basically what you're doing is in renouncing it and breaking its power is that you're applying the blood of Jesus over this generation of sin and iniquity. Amen? Amen. Now, number six, you receive God's freedom from it. I receive God's freedom from this sin and from the resulting curses. Right? I receive, and in place of the curse, you want to receive a blessing. Look at Deuteronomy 11. Now, this is a choice. We're going to receive a blessing, and we're going to pray. All right, we're, Ryan, are you through the blessing? Yeah, okay. So listen, I, I want you to take this as, as we're going to enter into the, the one song of worship. But I want you to pray. I want, I want the Lord to show, I want you to ask the Lord if there's anything in your bloodline. And I, I, I printed this sheet out here just to give you some help. If, if anything resonates from this list, just apply it to this prayer. Right, number one, see that blank line for number one? Just apply it there, right? Confess it, renounce it, break the power. But look at Deuteronomy 11, 26 and 20, through 28, because this is about the receiving the blessing and receiving a blessing is a choice. And I don't know about you, but my choice is to receive the blessing of the Lord. It says, look today, I'm giving you the choice between a blessing and a curse. You will be blessed if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today. But you will be cursed if you reject the commands of the Lord your God and turn away from him and worship gods you have not known before. And so going back to idolatry, if you turn, away, if you turn to idolatry, if you turn to whatever it is that thing is, are you bringing a curse on your life? But I would say today, let's choose the blessing of the Lord. And so let's pray through this. I want you to do it personally. I, I went through it. I gave you scripture about it. A lot of you have received ministry, but just ask the Lord if there's anything because we're, we're all in process, right? And so this is a very, very simple part of deliverance, but it is necessary because we've all had ancestors. We've all had parents. And unless these things are dealt with, they will be in place there will be an effect in our lives. And listen, you may not even see it manifesting yet in your life. But when I talked about the conditions and, and how things are activated under certain circumstances in our lives, right? There could be a judgment or something in your life, right? That you judge somebody for being a certain age or, or in a certain situation in their life. And until you reach that place where they were when you judge them, that thing will not manifest. So it doesn't mean that the spiritual law is in place if you're not seeing it carried out. Am I making sense? Because once, once the circumstances in your life 
are, are to that place where the judgment is in place, that curse, that judgment will manifest. It's a spiritual law. So pray, repent. It's been a little time. I'm just going to invite you up front as Ryan leads us through, through this song. Yeah. So just, I just want to comment on illegitimacy. The Bible literally calls it in the King James Version a bastard curse. And, and in Deuteronomy 23, it talks about illegitimacy, which goes down 10 generations, 400 years. And, and with that, when there's illegitimacy, there's rejection, there's uh, um, like hiding, a spirit of, you know, because sometimes they're ashamed and they're pregnant, abandonment issues, but uh, a lot of rejection. And, and then, you know, like there's, um, in, you know, um, what do you call that, when you're pregnant, um, in vitro, you know, um, what do you call that? What do you call it? I'm drawing a blank here. No, no, when the woman's pregnant and um, the wounds that come in the child, what do we call that? Yeah, in utero sin. And so um, I just want you to be aware of the, the importance. It's not just so, so they had a child, at least they had the baby. Yeah, thank God they didn't abort the baby, but there's a curse that goes down 10 generations which is why it just, it just repeats itself. It's a perpetual thing. And so in repenting for that, it's like, Lord, you know, I want to go back 10 generations because you can read it through in Deuteronomy 23. And it's like you always feel on the outside looking in. You're not, you know, you don't feel welcomed. I mean, a lot of people feel that way and they're not illegitimate, but that is one of the curses that come along with illegitimacy. So if, if anyone, you know, we had illegitimacy in my family. So if... Um, there's that in your family. Just just pray through it. But I wanted you to be aware of the effects of it. And even though you as a parent may be praying, David's praying for his children, they still are going to have to pray. And so, um, but the power of the blood brings freedom. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tricia. Yeah, let's, let's pray. Well, yeah, let's just step into the blessing of the Lord as you pray. I'll pray. I'll pray and then you go. Father, we thank you for just the word of the Lord. We thank you for the blood of Jesus right now. God, Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would just come and invade this place with your sweet presence, with your sweet touch. And just, just show us lovingly. Show us lovingly. If there's anything in place right now, any spiritual laws, any generational sins and iniquities that, that may be in our bloodline, Father, just pray for revelation on it right now. God, we just ask right now that you would show us any illegitimacy, any divorce, any sexual sin that may be in our, in our bloodline, Father. Lord God, we repent for it right now. Any shame, fear, anxiety, mental illness and depression, trauma, Father, any generational trauma, Father. Lord, just reveal it to us now, God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father.